Good morning. My name is Mamdouh Mubarak. I'm a data scientist at Archer Aviation, and I'm here today to talk to you about how uh, the data science team at Archer has been using any logic uh, to inform strategy at Archer. So a little bit about uh, us. Uh, Archer is designing and building an EVTOL aircraft. Uh, that stands for Electric Vertical Takeoff and Landing Vehicle. Uh, some people like to refer to them as uh, flying cars. And uh, our goal is to use these vehicles to launch an air taxi service. So we're going to uh, be aiming to replace 60 to 90 minutes uh, car rides with uh, 10 to 20 minutes uh, electric flights that are safe, uh, sustainable, cost competitive, and then uh, low noise. And this is uh, our aircraft. Uh, this is Midnight, uh, our uh, aircraft. Um, it, it's a piloted aircraft with uh, four passengers um, and a range of about 100 miles. Uh, the payload is about uh, 1,000 uh, pounds, so uh, fully electric. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we're going to be using it to launch uh, an urban air mobility service, or UAM, um, air, basically air taxi. Uh, and launching this service really requires more than uh, the aircraft. We really have to be very thoughtful about the entire ecosystem that this aircraft will operate in. And at the heart of this ecosystem is a network of vertiports. Uh, and you probably is, are asking, what is a vertiport? Uh, so vertiports are the facilities that will support the operations of these uh, aircraft. So think of airports for regular aviation. That's what Vertiport is for uh, EVTOL aircrafts. Uh, so this is an example of what we envision our Vertiports to uh, look like. Now, before I go into the model, uh, I just want to set the stage with some terminology, um, basically aviation or like uh, industry terminology. You're going to be hear hearing me talk about FATO. That stands for final approach and takeoff area. This is basically the area where the aircraft will land in the vertiport. So again, for regular aviation, think of a uh, runway. This is where uh, the aircraft will land and take off from. Um, the other uh, term that I want to introduce is gates. Again, these are where uh, aircraft will park and get serviced. Uh, this is where passengers will board uh, the aircraft as well, and this is where we will charge the aircraft. Um, but not all vertiports will have gates and fados. And that leads to the next term, which is vertiport topology. Um, some vertiports will have fado only. For example, the vertiport that I have here on, uh, on the right, it has two fados and it has no gates. So all the operation will happen at the fado. Uh, the topology on the left, we refer to it as 1-3. So this has one fado and three gates. And in this case, the aircraft will land at the FATO and then taxi to the gate. And this is where we do our operations. So with that said, as we are launching this uh, UAM service, there's a list of questions that we need to address. Some of them are related to the vertiport design. So how many FATOs and how many gates do we need to place in a vertiport? What kind of charging infrastructure do we need? And how many of these chargers do we need? Uh, how, many how much power should we su uh, supply this vertiport for, with in order to charge all these aircraft? Uh, other questions are related to the operation of vertiport. So how much time is it going to take to turn an aircraft? And turning an air aircraft means all the uh, service and operations that happens at the vertiport. So loading passengers, unloading passengers, and charging as well. Uh, what staffing level do we need at the Vertiport? How many people do we need to, to run it efficiently? And what are the bottlenecks in an efficient operation? And our team is trying to take a data-driven approach to answer these questions, uh, but this is a new industry and we're starting a new service. There is no data, really. Uh, and that's why we decided to simulate. So we built uh, our Vertiport simulation uh, model, we call it Zoe. Uh, this is a snapshot of the model. 
the input to the model or the vertiport uh, topology and uh, design, basically, and a list of parameters from the aircraft as well as the flight schedule. And then uh, we run the simulation for a day, and then we collect data about the vertiport performance, uh, such as throughput, ground time, asset utilization, and so on. So, as I mentioned, there's a lot of questions that uh, we're using this uh, tool to answer, but I'm just going to focus on two for uh, my presentation today. The first one is related to the topology. How many FADOs and how many gates do we need at each vertiport? And the second one is related to charging infrastructure. So, topology evaluation. These vertiports will be built in urban areas. Think of downtown LA, downtown San Francisco, very crowded areas where space is very, very limited. And that's why we need to make sure we're actually building the optimal vertiport and the optimal layout for a vertiport. Now consider these two uh, different layouts. The one on the right here is what we refer to as 1-3. Uh, this layout can support up to three aircraft. That's the capacity of it. Uh, the other layout, 2-0 here, two FADO and no gate, can support up to uh, two aircraft. So we have better capacity in the 1-3 layout. However, in the 1-3 layout, the aircraft needs to move from the FADO to the gate and back, which means lower utilization of the aircraft. The aircraft in the 2-0 can be flying more, moving passengers around, so we can have higher utilization. These two takes pretty much the same space from an architecture perspective. And the question is, how can we compare them with other metrics as well? Uh, how do they compare, for example, in terms of throughput? So to answer these questions, we simulated uh, both these layouts. So uh, on the left here, you can see the model uh, running on a 2-0 layout. Uh, and to the right, we're modeling the 1-3 uh, layout. And you can see here on the 1-3, the aircraft lands at the FADO, uh, marked in red, and then it taxis to the gate, and this is where we do all our operations, and then it taxi back to the FADO and then uh, takes off. The green dots here are the staff agent. They're moving between the terminal and the aircraft in order to service the aircraft. So, you know, how do these two compare in terms of uh, throughput? One of the key parameters in this analysis is the taxi time. The time it takes for the aircraft in the 1-3 layout to move between the gate and the FADO. So we, talk, we worked with airline and we uh, got a value as a baseline for uh, this taxi time and then we run the analysis, we run these scenarios. So the chart here on the left shows the throughput uh, for each of these scenarios, and then chart to the right shows ground time. And um, so what we found is that at the baseline of our taxi time, actually 2-0 give us higher throughput. The ground time, which is the time that the aircraft spends on the ground, taxiing, getting service, taxiing back, is actually higher on 1.3, which makes sense because we have the added taxi time here. So then we said, well, what if we can taxi faster? What would that do to our throughput? And we found that 1.3 is actually now getting closer to 1.0 th to, to, to in, uh, in terms of throughput. And then we kept going with these different scenarios until we were able to identify the exact taxi time where these two uh, layouts actually are the same in terms of throughput. So we were able to tell that to the right of this dotted line here, this is the area where 1-3 is dominant. And to the left of this line, this is the area where 2-0 is actually the better layout in terms of throughput. So through the use of uh, simulation, although we did not have any data, we were able to decide under which conditions each layout actually is uh, the dominant layout. So that was the topology uh, uh, question. The other question that we addressed was related to the uh, charging infrastructure. So we worked with the battery team, and they came to us and they said, hey, there's two types of chargers that we can install in our vertiports. There are uh, two-module charger 
and their eight module charger. The two module charger here is on the right and the eight module charger is on the left. And the idea is that the eight module charger give us more uh, flexibility in power distribution. So assume, for example, that uh, the aircraft on the red uh, gate here requires two thirds of the capacity of the charger. In the two module charger, we cannot allocate two thirds of the power. So we allocate the entire charger to the, uh, to the aircraft on the red Fado, which leave the other aircraft uh, not charging until we're able to reallocate. However, when we have eight module charger, we can allocate two thirds of the charger to the aircraft on red, and that leaves two thirds of the charger that can be allocated to the aircraft on blue. And the question that the battery team have is, what are the benefits of this flexibility? Can we actually measure it so we know if the benefits actually is enough to offset the cost of uh, these chargers? So we modeled these two chargers in, uh, in any logic and in the same model. And using the visualization, we were able to uh, verify or, and validate that the model is actually behaving the way we expect it to behave. So, what I have here, uh, for example, on the left is the case where we install eight module charger. And then you can see the aircraft on Fado B starts charging first. And you see that the aircraft on A starts charging right after uh, minute 20. So it's charge, uh, start charging early. And then the green area is the overlap between uh, both of these. So both of them are charging at the same time throughout this entire green shaded area. On the two module charger, on the other hand, you can see that the, air uh, the aircraft on uh, Fado A won't start charging until minute 30. Uh, the Y axis represents the state of charge of the aircraft. So what you can see is by the time aircraft A, sorry, aircraft B finished charging, Aircraft A on two module charger didn't even reach 50%, while on eight uh, module charger, it reached way above 50%, about 75% about state of charge. So clearly, there's a lot of efficiency that we can gain by having this uh, eight module charger. And we wanted to understand, you know, how does that translate in terms of throughput, and how does that trans translate in terms of value? So we ran these. Uh, two cases, again, with our simulation, and we were able to capture the throughput under each scenario. Uh, and then we, we got the difference in throughput, the delta in throughput. We talked with our friends in the finance team to put a value uh, to that difference in terms of uh, revenue. And we gave that number to uh, the battery team so they can make an informed decision about what type of uh, charging infrastructure we need. And again, this is an example where we use simulation, and we did not have data, but using simulation, we were able to create uh, that data. So as I mentioned, there's a list of questions that uh, we are addressing with this uh, tool. Um, and th we're currently working with um, the airline organization to work on the staffing level. We need to understand how many people we need to run these uh, vertiports. A uh, list of questions keep growing, and we keep adding more features uh, to this model. And uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, my colleague, Mike Prince, uh, for his great contribution as well to this model, and thank AnyLogic for the opportunity to present and open it for questions. Thank you very much for that talk. I'm just up here in the front. Um, so the first question was, um, you were, I appreciate that you did some sort of kind of sensitivity around the, the taxi time. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there are other factors that are maybe a greater unknown that you weren't able to capture. So I would imagine demand is one of those. So I imagine if you were to include demand variability, time of day change and so on, that might completely change your conclusions with yep. regards to both things you modeled. Yep, yeah, great question. So the analysis that I presented uh, looks at the, we're kind of testing the capacity of the uh, vertiport. So we're looking at if we can um, blast as many aircraft as possible to the aircraft, to the vertiport, uh, 
and we're trying to like reach the limit of the vertiport, what does that look like? But we also uh, have uh, modeled a scenario where we don't have uh, kind of like a blasting aircraft, but we have distribution. So flights arrive at a certain distribution, uh, and we measure these scenarios as well. Uh, further, we actually have another tool that um, kind of estimate what expected schedule should be uh, for a certain network, and we are able to connect uh, this model to the data that we have in the schedules and then test different schedules and also test the utilization and uh, other uh, parameters as well. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, and one small other question, uh -huh. and maybe it's very simple, but yeah. uh, is there a reason you guys didn't look at battery swapping technologies instead of charging? Uh, yes, great, great question. Actually, that was one of the first questions that I uh, asked when I joined Archer. Uh, so from an FAA perspective, my understanding and I'm not an expert there, so don't quote me on this, but my understanding is that any change you do to the aircraft uh, will require a whole bunch of testing that we need before we can take off again, and that time to do all these tests is actually longer than the time it takes to uh, charge these aircraft. I mean, charging for what we expect our average mission to be about 20 miles, and charging for 20 miles is about uh, 12 minutes, uh, so by the time we unload passengers and load passengers and service the aircraft, the, the aircraft should be charged. So charging is barely the bottleneck there. Yep. Hey, uh, back here, uh, Benjamin Schumann. Super interesting topic. Over here. <laughs> to your left. Oh, <laughs> hello, okay. hello. Yep. Um, yeah, I love the topic. My, my question is really simple. With all, you have a lot of opponents, I think, in the industry of not wanting you to fly through inner cities. Uh, the simple question is, will this ever fly? And if so, will it ever fly just not for rich people? Will it ever be a toy that normal people can afford instead of rich people who just swap out the helicopter and now do it cheaper right with you guys? Yeah, great question. Uh, so our target is actually to fly in 2025. Uh, assuming we get the FAA uh, certification, and that's, that's what we're working on, actually. We're, being very, uh, you know, we're pursuing the, certifica uh, the certification very seriously. Uh, in terms of your second question, uh, we are planning for uh, this service to be actually affordable, especially at scale, and it's going to be competitive with UberX. Uh, the reason why this is going to be affordable is if you compare it to, for example, helicopter service, the reason why helicopter is, is expensive, number one, is that maintenance. Maintenance is very expensive because there's a lot of uh, single point of failure in a helicopter, and that's why it requires a lot of maintenance. Beside, of course, fuel. Uh, in electric aviation, you do not have that. Uh, so maintenance is way cheaper, and then it's electric, so that adds as well to the uh, cost part of it, so it's going to be very cost competitive, and at scale, we're targeting to be competitive with UberX. Other questions? All right, thanks.